Welcome. Good evening. My name is Zygmunt from River Cruise Center and with me, although 100 miles away, is Richard and from Amar Waterways. And this is the ninth in our series of webinars for the summer. And uh, we welcome you and I want to thank you for spending your time with us. The previous webinars, if you missed them, are posted at rivercruisecenter.com. The Danube, the castle, the wine, the tulip, uh, Paris to Normandy, and a couple more will be posted within the next two or three days. You can always go to rivercruisecenter.com and see the posted webinars. Today, Richard will be leading the webinar. And uh, thank you, Richard, for doing it. I'm turning it over to Richard. Very good, Sigmund. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. I appreciate it. And it's it's crazy. We were just talking everybody about this ninth in our season of, of different presentations. Um, we've covered all from the Danube to the Rhine, the Moselle. We talked about our themed departures from um, you know, Christmas markets to the celebration of wine. So uh, it, it's been an exciting time. Definitely go on to uh, rivercruisecenter.com to have a look at some of these if you're interested. Um, I know Zygmunt is going to con continue to promote these. So again, please reach out to him. And thank you once again for, for joining us. And I don't know if anybody's had a chance to join us on, on all these presentations, but if you have, thank you. Or um, any previous one. And Zygmunt, thank you once again for working with Alma Waterways and being able to, to share our product with, with all your valued guests. Today we're going to be talking about um, the Mekong River traveling through Vietnam and, and Cambodia, what some of those optional land extensions are for you. Um, you know, even one that goes up into Bangkok, Thailand too. So some really wonderful things to, to kind of pick around here. I can tell you with all the presentations that we, we've done, and Zygmunt, I think, has heard me share this um, with all the response that we hear from uh, a number of guests and people that have done, a, you know, traveled around the world, even ones that have done um, Amawada ways different times, a lot of them come back with the same response once they've done the Mekong River and just say there was something extra special about this particular um, sailing, you know, the, the stops along the way. The people are so genuine and, and authentic. It's just um, rich in history and culture and traditions, the local cuisines from Southeast Asia, um, specifically Vietnam and Cambodia, of course, um, and just all the wonderful little villages that we're going to stop at along the way from, you know, big cities to these rural villages, from historic pagodas to, to monasteries, the day markets and the night markets. There's just a lot to, to do from, you know, even gourmet cuisine to the street food experience. So a wonderful place to explore. So today we're just going to be giving a number of different highlights on those things, not giving too much away, but hopefully just enough to inspire you. But with every presentation, I do like to begin with just a short uh, little appreciation to our owners. And uh, the reason I do this is because they're really the ones who put together this amazing company, this amazing product. Um, this is Rudy and Christine that we see to the left here in this picture, husband and wife. Rudy's actually an architect by trade. He grew up in Europe, um, in Vienna. He grew up on the river, so that's always been near and dear to him. Um, years and years ago, in his early 20s, he actually went out and did a, a, a river rafting expedition <clears throat> on the Amazon River. He actually built his own raft. He's an architect by trade. I, I don't know if I mentioned that a second ago. And um, he went out exploring that for a period of months. So doing something on the water has always been near and dear and close to his heart. Um, Christine, she's from Germany also, and, um, you know, being close to the rivers there, being within Europe, Gary Murphy, our senior VP, uh, president, uh, he is actually the son of a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Murphy, who was one of the original co-founders along with Rudy and Christine. Jimmy actually started another company called Brendan Vacations some years ago. If you've ever done any um, tours, you may have possibly booked with Brendan Vacations. So I share all this just to kind of let you know, like there's a lot of history with this team right here. But more importantly, the product that they put together, we, we just celebrated our 18 year anniversary on uh, July 1st. But the idea in creating Alma Waterways was to create something that they themselves, our owners, would want to do time and time again. And they do that. Uh, Gary Murphy actually takes his family on one of our Christmas market sailings every single year. You know, everything we put together is very thoughtfully curated. Okay. Uh, we, we offer two itineraries that are, that are actually quite similar. Um, the primary difference being that one travels northbound while the other travels southbound. But, um, but they're traveling between Kampong Chan to uh, Maito. So you see Kampong Chan up there on the northern part and then um, making its way all the way down to, to Maito on the southern end. So our northbound sailing is Charms of the Mekong, and our southbound sailing is the Riches of the Mekong. That's a primary difference between the two. I think there may be one port of call on either direction. 
Note that every one of our sailings also, um, not only on the Mekong, but anywhere that we travel, um, guests are gonna have the opportunity for this pre and post options that I mentioned as well. So in the case of the Mekong River um, experience, we include pre or post extensions to Siem Reap, Cambodia or Bangkok, Thailand. There's also Halong Bay, Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi, Vietnam. And Hanoi is this vibrant city, um, capital of Vietnam. And it actually just celebrated, well, not just celebrated in 2010, it celebrated its millennial um, anniversary. But um, these are, again, some of the pre and post packages that allow our guests to really just take in more time of the highlights in the area. The nice thing is that our cruise managers join me for that pre-trip and that post-trip. And while it's important on any different sailing that you're gonna do with Ama Waterways, I tend to think when you're in a place like Cambodia and Vietnam to, to cover that language barrier, to point you in the right directions, it's even more important for a, a sailing like this. So just one extra tip I wanted to include there. Uh, Ho Chi Minh City, um, commonly known as Saigon, of course, um, city in Southern Vietnam and also the most populous with an estimated 13 million residents, um, as well as about 8 million motorbikes. Um, so you gotta be, be aware of those. If you've ever seen some some videos, if you just take a moment to, to Google, I'm not gonna try and share another video right now. Um, you'll, you'll see just how many motorbikes are, are crowding the streets. Um, lots to do and explore in this energetic city. Um, this tall building that we see off to the right of this image, this is actually the financial building. It's actually within walking distance, easy walking distance from our hotel, which is located in the French quarter where we're gonna be staying. Um, if you can see that small flat platform um, kind of sticking out to the top left of this building near the top there, uh, that's a helipad. And near this is a watering hole called the Eon Heli Bar. We can grab a nice refreshing local drink um, such as the Saigon Fizz. This is a local favorite. Um, it's got this sort of a heady sparkling wine concoction and they add some Tanqueray gin, mint, and some lime juice. And um, I hear it's, it's really good. I haven't personally tried it, but it seems to be a favorite. Um, but more important that I, would, that I would say are the breathtaking and inspiring views from up atop 52 stories, um, looking out at the sunset, looking out at, at the city kind of comes alive at, at night. I think that's um, gonna be well worth it for you. So just one little suggestion there. And um, one of our excursions uh, while we're there in Ho Chi Minh City is a trip to the historic post office. This was built during the French colonial times. Um, so you'll certainly see that in the architecture right here. Um, the Saigon Central Post Office, among one of the most impressive post offices in all of Southeast Asia, actually. Um, a lot of people have uh, attributed this to Gustave Eiffel, uh, Eiffel, who, of course, did the, the Eiffel Tower, amongst some other great pieces of work. Um, but this was, in fact, actually done um, by the work of a... Uh, uh, Marie Alfred Falhoy, uh, Saigon's acclaimed architect in chief. So um, if you ever hear that, um, it's, it's a bit of a myth, I guess. And it was actually uh, Marie Alfred who uh, designed this. And here's a look inside. It was actually constructed in 1886, um, in 1889, between that period. And um, you can just see these beautiful looping arches, just this intricate uh, designed um, marble floors. You can't really see that in this picture right here. There's these beautiful antique um, telephone boxes also that you can find inside, but we'll get a chance to stop here as well. And then we'll also get a chance to go visit the beautiful Notre Dame Cathedral, um, which was actually built from materials fully shipped in from France. So of course, uh, the French influence right there is officially named the Cathedral Basilica of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. Um, the cathedral was constructed between 1863 and 1880. And it's, um, it's well known also by these distinctive twin bell towers that sort of frame the entrance here, um, reaching up 190 feet high. So another opportunity uh, for guests to stop here as well. On all of our Alma Waterways cruises, we're going to include a number of shore excursion optionals for you. So include up to four even more in some locations to really give you a choice of uh, the things that you want to do. Of course, if you've maybe been to some of these areas um, before, and you want to go out and do your own thing, then that's an opportunity for you as well. Um, the Coochie Tunnels, again, this is all sort of that time when we're still there, um, haven't even boarded the ship yet. The Coochie Tunnels um, is famous for the, these extensive groundworks that were, were actually laid approximately stretching 150 miles. Um, so it's actually the communist forces that began digging these uh, this network of tunnels under the jungle terrain of southern Vietnam in the late 1940s and uh, during the War of Independence from French colonial authority, the tunnels were often dug by hand actually and um, only a short distance at a time. But 
Um, of course, doing that by hand, you wouldn't expect them to get too, too far, but just a commitment in building these. And then, of course, in later times, these were used by the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, helped them to covertly, uh, to covertly rather, move supplies, troops, um, and really just survive, um, helping them to prolong the war. Um, and it was estimated that there were upwards of about 1,200 families at one time that were living down here. Um, for oxygen and getting some air down in the caves, they would actually use um, like some bamboo shoots and pop them up to the ground in different areas. So, um, I mean, just really impressive when you think that of what of what man can achieve. You know, they had their hospitals down here, and um, again, here's just another look in this picture. You can see how um, how they were carved out and have all the tunnels through all these different areas. So, this is an opportunity to visit as well um, to enter these tunnels at least in some of the areas that we get to see um, where they would actually go into them. They're these really tiny, tiny um, little square uh, uh, cut places in the ground where they would uh, lift off the lid and kind of squeeze, literally squeeze themselves down through there and then be sure to kind of cover up the lid with some grass and other debris from the area so it would keep it you know, inconspicuous. And then we'll have an opportunity to um, to board our home away from home. This is the beautiful Amadara, um, affectionately uh, known as well by the as the Love Star, um, not the Love Boat, the Love Star. But um, this beautiful vessel was built in 2015 and has 62 rooms on board. So I got that number mixed up. Um, I was thinking 62 staterooms, uh, Zygmunt, when you asked that. So it's actually the 62 staterooms and 124 guests, but still on the more intimate side there. Um, and again, that would be operating at, at full capacity at double occupancy, which isn't always going to be the case. So definitely a bit more intimate there. Um, it's an all balcony ship too. So every guest is going to have their, their own private stateroom to be able to take in a nice drink, take in some appetizers, just sit back, get some great photos from the privacy of their own stateroom. Um, the decor on board the ship is beautiful, uh, very French colonial design with a number of um, some really rich um, carvings that were kind of inspired from the, the wood and different things in the area as well. But in terms of the crew on board Amaways, I don't think any any crews would be the same if we did not have these guests on board. They really make this come to life on any sailing, whether you're doing it in the Mekong or, or over in Europe. Um, you can see we've got some local uh, crew there that, that are on board and they're just fun. They're engaging. They pay attention to all the details. They, they um, you know, are going to know what what type of wine you want when you want your um, cappuccino served to you all these little details they just pay close attention um, but they're just really fun they're incredibly smart can make some great recommendations for for you too so with all the responses we hear from all our guests we probably hear equally about our, our staff on board um, equally to the destinations that they're going to see um, if not more in some cases so I thought that was important to point out um, another wonderful experience on board is a chef's table restaurant. And what I like to point out here also, if you haven't heard of the um, uh, La Chaine de Rotissière, this is the world's oldest international gastronomic society founded in Paris back in 1248. And this is a um, society that is based on the traditions and practices of the old French Royal Guild of Goose Roasters. Um, so they gradually expanded to, to roasting all poultry and meat and and other games. And there, there's this wonderful kind of history behind it. It went for about 400 years, stopped for a period of time um, based, because of the, the French Revolution. So anything related to royalty, they kind of didn't want to have anything to do with it. But what it really speaks to is the quality, the, the preparation um, of, of the food, the freshness of the food, um, all, all these different things that come into play. You cannot request to be a part of this society, this La Chaine de Rotissière. You really just have to be handed this designation. And Amo Waterways is the only river cruise line with that designation on board all of our river cruise vessels. But this restaurant specifically that we're looking at, this is our chef's table restaurant. And it's an alternative dining experience. So when you get on board, you'll make your reservations, but there's no additional charge for this. So um, it's included in the passage. So in addition to the main dining room, you have this wonderful experience. It's a six course meal, but you get some different choices with each of those courses. And then there's some wonderful wine pairings with it. You get to see the chef and his team preparing the meals, plating the food, bringing it out. And it's it's my favorite experience on board any one of our sailing. So definitely take time to make those reservations um, once you get on board. Just a few pictures that I want to include from some of the local entertainment here. Um, so when we're docked in, we'll look to bring on some of the, uh, the local entertainers, whether it's uh, 
dancers or musicians or, or, or some other things too. But you can see in the lower right picture how they do their best to get the, um, the audience involved as well too. So just fun interacting, uh, another way just to, to be social and meet some other guests. This next slide right here is a look at one of our twin balcony state rooms um, that we have on board all of our other European vessels as well too, or majority of them, I should say, not, not all of them. Um, but what makes this really special is that you get the benefit of the French balcony. So you have that nice little um, kind of separate sitting area right there, amazing views, especially because you're so close to that railing and that window still opens too, if you want to open it, kind of lean outside. But if you get really wonderful weather and you want to sit out in the morning, and enjoy some coffee or and sip on a nice glass of wine in the evening as you're watching that sunset, you'll have the opportunity to do that as well too. So these rooms are beautiful, 226 um, square feet. Um, the sun deck, this is where you'll certainly spend some time, especially in a destination like this. It's so tropical, hanging out in the pool there to cool off a bit, um, sitting back, taking in the scenery, you know, enjoying a drink, some appetizers, meeting with some other guests, um, just falling into that vacation mode, you know, and just really, separating yourself, detaching yourself from everything going on back home, and um, just really, you know, uh, taking in the local experience. Uh, one of our stops along the river um, is a small district called Kai Bay, and um, here we're going to have an opportunity to visit and shop with some of the locals. This is where many of the local families have actually had their living for generations on, on trading, selling goods, you know, fruits, vegetables, spices, and a number of other things. Um, and you'll be able to find some of the famous caramel coconut candies. Uh, as well as a snake wine that we can see here in this picture. Um, snake wine, if you've never heard of this too, it's actually an alcoholic beverage. They produce it by um, literally infusing the whole snake in this rice wine or, or grain alcohol. Um, the snake venom proteins are unfolded as it goes through this process by the ethanol, um, which brings it to a safe level of being able to drink it. So we are actually going to have an opportunity to go to a place where they make the snake wine. You could do a tasting if you're daring enough also. Um, we're also going to go to a place where we get to um, see them uh, doing the, uh, the coconut candy that I mentioned. So this is on the right side. So it's cooked with a mixture of coconut water, salt, sugar, and some other ingredients um, for flavor. It's cooled and then hand cut into these really nice uh, bite-sized pieces that you can buy as well. And we'll do a tasting there. Um, to the left is what they call popped rice. And um, this is poured into this large hot pan that, that we see right here um, with, uh, with sand and stirred until the rice starts to pop. And then it's mixed with some sugar and some ginger um, and poured in this mold and cut in some nice pieces also for tasting as well too. So again, when, when you're traveling, you know, if, if you're a little adventurous, especially in a place like Cambodia and Vietnam, they're going to be some really cool opportunities to, to take advantage of. This here is, uh, if you remember this gentleman here, this is Gary, and this is our um, senior vice president. And I mentioned he's the one that does the Christmas markets all the time with his family. He will, will tell you, um, hands down, this is his favorite itinerary. Of all the different itineraries, he's done more, of course, than, than probably anybody else. Um, this is his favorite experience. I think that's something really to, to take note of. And this is here, um, him here just enjoying a local meal from um, some of the locals there. I think I went over one of the slides too quick. Um, transportation is always big on, on, on any on any vacation travel, right? You know, planes, trains, automobiles, of course, in this case, the river ship cruising, as we're transferring you from one place to another, you may be, may be on a motor coach where you're going to have expert guides, but we also will include um, at some different points uh, a ride in, in, in a trishaw as an example. And this picture doesn't capture it um, quite as well as, um, I believe it's just up ahead in this picture where we're actually going right along the river and it's just it's just beautiful. Um, but we may hop in in, in a tuk-tuk. We may um, hop in an ox cart. There's an opportunity actually to ride in an ox cart. So we'll get to enjoy some of those different modes of transportation along with some of the expert guides who are pointing things out to you, doing that storytelling, you um, just really making you feel more enriched in the culture. Um, in Tan Chao, here's a picture of uh, another workshop where they're creating these um, these uh, these mats out of these different colored reeds. You get to witness that process. There's a lot of things you're going to want to buy along the way. Um, do a little bit of research before to see where the best places are to buy certain things also. Um, we'll get to one of those examples in a bit. I'll be sure to point it out. But some of these things you'll be able to pick up along the way, which is great. Just grab it when you want to. But there's some other places that might have something um, a little bit more unique and, and even more authentic. 
Um, so continuing on our way, we're going to make our way to um, Phnom Penh. And um, in the city um, is the Royal Palace, which is still the resident of the king. Um, Phnom Penh was named after a Buddhist temple, Wat Nam. Um, it stood high atop their city since the 14th century. And um, Penh was actually a real person. I, I did a little bit of research just to kind of see some things. And um, so it was actually a real person, um, a nun who actually played a prominent role in the founding of the city. So that's uh, where, where this got its name from. And just a couple of other quick facts um, while earning many nicknames over the years, uh, it used to be often referred to as the Paris of the East as well as the Pearl of Asia due to the French influence um, in the architecture and the city design. And um, if you are just a total different side note, um, if you've ever been interested in trying tarantula, this will be the place you wanna try that also. Um, I certainly would not be adventurous to do that, but um, maybe if you had a few drinks and you're feeling tempted, um, they've got some tarantula kebabs here that um, of course they say tastes like chicken. So that doesn't sound too bad. Um, today, we're gonna also enjoy a tuk-tuk ride uh, of the city and also visit the largest museum of cultural history and the country's leading historical and archeological museum. Um, the museum houses one of the world's largest collections of Khmer art, which dates back centuries to the ancient times of the Khmer Empire between 802 and 1431. So I, I'd say that is ancient. Um, and just a quick note on the monks. You know, the monks um, are actually supported by profits from some of the local communities and towns and villages. Many of the, um, uh, the less fortunate families will often send their, their boys here for, for food, for shelter, for education. Um, and interestingly enough, they can actually stay a few days if they want, they can stay several years if they want, or they can stay a lifetime. The nuns, by contrast, know that when they sign up, it is for a lifetime. So it's not uh, just a few days or, or an easy backing out thing. They're making a lifetime commitment. Um, we'll then uh, have another opportunity in Phnom Penh, which includes a visit to the memorial of the killing fields where approximately 2 million Cambodians were killed under the Khmer Rouge regime. And this of course is a more emotional experience and this visit is optional as every other visit is gonna be optional. Um, but if you're into history and, and just, you know, being able to kind of like witness some of these things um, firsthand, my apologies for going too quick there. Um, uh, th there is gonna be this opportunity here too. So the Khmer Rouge was this brutal regime that ruled Cambodia. It was operated under the leadership of the Marxist uh, dictator Pol Pot from 75 to 79. Um, Pol Pot's attempts to create a Cambodian master race through social engineering ultimately led to all these deaths. And uh, those killed were either executed as enemies of the regime or died from starvation, disease, or even overwork. Um, historically, this period is shown in the film, The Killing Fields has come to be known as a Cambodian genocide. So again, an emotional um, uh, opportunity if you did want to visit this, this uh, location as well. And then uh, Odong blessing ceremony. So from the early 17th century through 1866, Odong served as the royal capital city of Cambodia. Um, its main attraction is the Odong Mountain, which boasts several historic and significant religious structures at its peak. Um, Padeo Dong is a place of pilgrimage for Cambodians also, um, or, or still, I should say. Um, and while here, you can be treated to a memorable Buddhist ceremony at the monastery, while also having some additional time just to explore the grounds and, and artwork, some beautiful artwork. Um, but we're gonna give you some leisurely time here also. I think it's important to mention at every stop along the way, you're gonna have these optional uh, excursions that I mentioned, but we do our very best to always allow our guests to have some leisurely time as well. We want them to be able to explore, go out and um, have a choice to, to do some of the things, maybe, uh, you know, do some extra shopping or just go out and see what some of the other things our locals are doing. And Richard, it's also important to mention that all those excursions are already included in the, in the price. They're not additional. This is right. That's right. Exactly. Um, the Okotni, uh, the own, uh, the own cot, Oknotni <laughs> Silk uh, Village is another one of those really special stops. And this is one that I was kind of referencing earlier too, um, and, and I'll explain in just a bit, but located on um, these, these beautiful left banks of the Mekong River, this island is known for its rich tradition of, of silk weaving, weaving. So while well, you can pick up some of these goods in other locations along the way, here is where it's going to be really authentic, right? Um, so here we're gonna visit um, the villages. There's about 200 families that are kind of nestled up on this um, stretch of the area. And, um, you know, so, you know, around the area, there's some rice paddies, a lot of fruit orchards. We're gonna show you how these local artisans engage um, in the entire silk production 
process from, you know, wheat and process for the villager still farm the silkworms. And those are those kind of large grub worms that we see over to the right there, placing them in bowls, letting them build their cocoons for 47 days. The cocoon, uh, cocoons are then boiled and uh, the threads make up, excuse me, the threads that, um, that make up the cocoons are pulled strand by strand and spun in silk thread. So that's how we get these beautiful uh, pieces of, of artwork that we see right here. So once a cocoon is, is raveled to, to string of silk 100 meters long, the threads are then dyed into a variety of beautiful colors that you see right here. So if I were going to be buying some of these beautiful silk um, uh, pieces that they're putting together, this is, I think, really the place as well. They may be really beautiful in some of the other areas. They're all machine uh, manufactured in most of the other places. This is where it's still really done in an uh, authentic way. Um, then the elementary school visit. This is one of the reasons why I think this itinerary is so special. And we changed some of these things also. Um, so I couldn't guarantee that this experience would still be happening. Um, but just to give you an idea, you know, or it used to be that we could stop here, take a chance to, to meet with the, the, the teacher um, at this local school, visit with some of the students right here, just those cute, beautiful little faces. Um, maybe you could uh, donate some goods like uh, pencils or some deflated soccer balls or things like that that you could actually deliver here. But that chance to really kind of be with the community, I think, really makes it special. So I just want to share that as well. Um, we then make our way into Siem Reap, a beautiful city with both French colonial and Chinese style architecture can be th seen throughout the city um, design. Um, there's plenty to explore uh, museums, uh, of course, some more souvenir and handicraft shopping, some great restaurants in this area. Um, opportunity to take in some traditional Aspara dance stuff that they do here at some of the different places. Uh, the Aspara dance is um, we've probably all seen it sometime in a movie or on television where the women are kind of sewn into these really um, form-fitting traditional dresses. They do this beautiful, creative, um, graceful, sinuous dance gestures that signify and narrate this um, classical myths or religious stories that they're telling through their dance. Um, so this would be the place we could take in some of that. Siem Reap is also the gateway to the famous ruins of the Angkor. Um, this was the seat of the Khmer Kingdom from the 9th to the 15th centuries. Um, Angkor's, uh, uh, sorry, um, the vast complex of these intricate stone buildings includes uh, preserved Angkor Wat, the main temple, which is pictured on Cambodia's flag. Um, giant mysterious faces are carved into the Bayon temple at Angkor Thom. And uh, in terms of border crossing, jump into the border crossing for a minute, right? So we've gone from Vietnam, we're now making our way into Cambodia. This question comes up a lot. Um, it's a very seamless process. So your passports and your visas, these are gonna be handed to your cruise manager at the start of the day. They're gonna hold on to them and basically take care of everything on the back end for you as you go out exploring for the afternoon. Um, and then you'll basically be handed back to you in the evening. So um, it's a good idea. I think Zygmunt would vouch for this also. Always carry, um, you know, a, a backup copy, any of your documents. Um, give, a, you know, another set of documents maybe to a family or friend member uh, back at home. Um, but that's how the how we handle the, the seamless processing of the, um, the visas and things like that when we're entering into these different countries and, and passing borders. Um, anchor and that's that's a very very good idea, Richard. Uh, just to emphasize on the passport, because I had a situation in uh, Indonesia where my passport was stolen, and uh, luckily I did have a copy of the passport page and my picture. Although I had some problems getting back out of Indonesia into uh, another country, but always whenever you travel, make sure you have a copy of the passport page with you in a separate location than your passport. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's just good practice. It's one of those things you hope you never need to um, have to access, but I've never ran into that. But hearing stories, those people that did take the steps to do that are incredibly grateful that they did. So um, definitely do that. Angkor Wat, I, I don't think anything prepares you, um, you know, for when you're going to visit one of the world's greatest architectural achievements of, of humanity. Um, you know, up there with the pyramids um, for sure, but you know, they're, the detail that goes into something like this. I mean, just personally speaking, I just think that intricacy is so amazing. This is those UNESCO World to, uh, Heritage Sites. But I always like to, to, to kind of share this example. If you've listened to some other presentations, you may have heard me share this, but I, I've grown up just as a kid loving history, loving geography, loving maps. Um, this is one reason why I decided to get into travel. But having seen some of these these type of pictures, like an anchor bot, um, 
like the Eiffel Tower, whatever it might be, there's that precise moment when your own eye will actually meet with that thing that you see only in, in history books or on television for the very first time. And, and there's just nothing to be able to, that can really recapture that moment. So Angkor Wat, I just want to share that because I think this is definitely one of those place, uh, places. Um, Angkor Wat translates to Temple City in the Khmer language. Um, the temple itself is protected by this massive moat that we can see right here. Its construction took um, only about th uh, 30 years, they say, um, with assistance of up to 40,000 elephants. Um, the temple is aligned with East and West Equinox, and uh, it's supposed to symbolize they came to the gods' cosmic mountains. And the project itself was designed to glorify both themselves, their gods, and their capital city. Um, the city of Angkor served as the royal center from which a dynasty of the Khmer kings ruled one of the largest, most prosperous, and most sophisticated kingdoms in the history of all of Southeast Asia. So, um, you know, when we're talking about history and, and culture, um, you know, this is is rich in, those, uh, in, in all those things right there, too. And um, this is just a short drive out of Siem Reap. I think it's maybe, you know, a 20-minute drive to be able to experience this from there. Um, and vegetation, I just I just love this picture right here at the Anchor Archaeological Park. Um, vegetation can be powerful, right? So to be able to, to witness some of this, um, this is actually where Tomb Raider, if you've seen the movie Tomb Raider um, with Angelina Jolie, this is actually where they filmed the, um, uh, a number of those scenes right there too. So if you go back and look at that, you, you may catch a glimpse of what we're looking at right here in this picture. And um, then we find ourselves in Heilong Bay. It's known for its, these, these beautiful emerald waters um, that we see right here, thousands of these towering limestone islands topped by rainforest, um, the junk boat tours, uh, kayak expeditions. Um, so there's a lot to do here. One of the days we're actually going to take um, our visitors out on this um, amazing uh, boat ride, this, this sort of yacht, if you will. Going to do some beautiful wine tasting on board. We're going to have some kayak series. You can head out and explore some. Um, but this is going to be a really, really fun full day that we're going to spend here. Um, there's also, I forget the name of it, but these, these different little limestone uh, mountains that we see out here, some of them have these little cave-like entrances. In fact, they are caves that you can actually get on, on like a kayak. And you, some of them are really, really low to the water, depending on, on, on the tide. You have to lay all the way back on these like kayak things as you go in through these little tunnels um, and you go clear across. So there's a number of bats that will sometimes um, go into these tunnels so you can actually, they, they smell. Um, but as you make your way all the way through, um, some of them have it where there's this whole body of water with inside this like little mountain area that you can kind of go and, and explore. So it's literally like, like it looks like a little, what you would imagine, like a little mini volcano, though they're not volcanoes, um, but you're within the interior of some of these little mountain things here too. So pretty spectacular. Um, and that's really the overview of, of the Mekong River. So again, I hope you really enjoyed that, hopefully inspired you just a bit. But there are a few other things that I want to touch on before we end. And then once again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, I'd love to be able to answer some of those for you. Um, I want to give a state of the business update um, because there's some really, I think, inspiring things to share. Um, but I want to begin with our Travel Weaver Plus um, because one of the questions that we're asked repeatedly, especially right now, as you can imagine, you know, what's the stability of this company? Um, I know Zygman gets a lot of questions like that with all the different partners he's working with. Um, we are very stable. We have all of our inventory completely paid off. We own, own them outright. Um, we are also partnered with some great financial uh, companies like um, Rothschild Group, um, Peugeot Family, amongst a number of others. So we're a solid company. We put together this program, the Travel Waiver Plus, as soon as COVID kind of came on the scene as a way for our guests to be able to protect their full travel investment. So as an example, once you've made your full payment, which is usually at like 90 days, um, if you were to cancel, even if you had like say a regular insurance, if you were to cancel say 60 to 90 days out, as an example, there would be a 35% penalty applied at that point. So if you're canceling for a non-covered reason, you would potentially lose out on that amount. With the Travel Waiver Plus, instead of you losing that amount, we would retain it as a future cruise credit. So when you're ready to travel again, we would have that on file for you and we could apply it towards that new booking. So again, a great way to protect the full investment of your, your trip. Um, in terms of um, what's happening right now, we do have a single ship that is sailing in Europe right now. And it's um, being chartered by a German company um, and it's exclusive 
for the German speaking audience at this time. Um, it's doing two different sailings out of Cologne, Germany. So if you're wondering, well, that doesn't help me, what, you know, what is the reason this is being shared? I'm sharing this for another really important reason because when, when everything happened with COVID, Alma Waterways with every other tr travel supplier out there and people in different industries wanted to know what things were going to look like when they were able to return back to business as normal or, or with the new normal. And um, so we had started putting those plans in place. We were doing research. We're staying on top of different requirements, what the European Union was putting out, what individual countries were putting out. And we had all these plans on paper. And now we're actually able to put those plans into place. So test the water, so to speak. Um, we're the only American river cruise line currently with the ship sailing in Europe right now. Um, so that's a big advantage that we're able to, again, put these things into practice. The response has been phenomenal from the German audience. No one has gotten sick. Um, a number of guests have actually rebooked a second time, and there's been a handful of people that have rebooked a third time already. And we've only been operating for going on just over six weeks now. Um, so that's the main reason that I want to share that. But in terms of, you know, what's what's it going to be like on board? Um, I don't want to have a hampered experience. I can tell you it's going to be minimal, minimal, minimal. Um, if you've had a chance to go into a restaurant anytime recently, you know that when you walk into the restaurant, you wear your mask, you get up to use the restroom, you leave the restaurant, you wear the mask. But when you're sitting down, you don't have to wear the mask. And that's the majority of the time. So this picture right here, I think, depicts that pretty well. Um, the people you're traveling with, you don't need to wear your mask by them. So we don't have that requirement on board. That nice plexiglass that, that keeps that nice social distancing going on, um, but still allows for the same atmosphere that we want to take place in the, uh, the lounge area, which is to keep that socialization going. So that's not going to be sacrificed at all. For the shore excursions, all of our guests are outfitted with something called this audio box headset. And that allows you to keep a, so, a safe social distance from the, the tour uh, guide. Um, and with this audio box, you can hear 40, 50 plus feet away everything that's being shared. You're not going to miss anything, but you got, again, that nice social distancing going on presently and specifically for this um, uh, one ship sailing in Europe. We have no more than 100 guests on board for the shore excursions, no more than between 10 to 15 maximum. So I just think that's a, um, important to take note of. So I wanted to give you that highlight. In terms of special offers now, we're, we're finishing up here. Um, we have a current offer in place, which offers up to $1,500 per stateroom savings or the option of taking free air. There's even some specials for business class air. There's an additional $300 onboard credit on select departures. Um, and if you book by Tuesday, September 29th, you'll receive an exclusive $100 additional savings per person. So. I know that was kind of a lot and it was kind of loaded. Thank you so much for bearing with me as, as I went through that. Um, those technical challenges there, but again, I hope you found this inspiring. If you have any questions whatsoever, please take note of Zygmunt's contact information here. If you don't have that uh, available, um, his number, his email address, and um, Zygmunt, if there's anything that you would like to add um, or, or want to go back and talk just a bit more on, um, I'd be happy to hear from you on that. Well, thank you, Richard. You did a great, uh, fantastic job on uh, this particular area. It's truly really a beautiful place to be. And I know people have been uh, very patient with us when the video didn't work, and I appreciate that. And I also thank you for spending all the time with us. Please give me a call or email me when you have any questions on any river cruise like that. Uh, we handle just the higher end cruises. And uh, this is kind of sad because it's the last one out of the summer series. We've been giving these seminars for, what, the last two months. So this is the last one. But I have a couple other ones coming up. And I want to email all of you on what else is coming up. Otherwise, I want to thank you, Richard, and thank you and Lee, who just who texted me earlier that you had uh, a lot of vodka. Uh, have another drink. Yes. So I, I'll be joining you shortly. But Zygmunt, thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. And um, we really look forward to welcoming you back sometime on board an Amawadaway cruise very, very soon. So um, be safe, everybody. Thank you once again.